Good morning and welcome to Inverness Christian Fellowship. We're delighted that you've been able to connect with us this morning at our online service. So Rob, you're going to be sharing, aren't you, a little bit later on, yep. carrying on mm -hmm. our series on Colossians. We'll look forward to hearing yep. that a little bit later on. Amy's going to be praying for mm -hmm. you and Scott's going to be doing the reading. So some young Isn't folks it? involved with us this morning and we're going to worship God together, aren't we? We are indeed. But before we do all that, let's pray. Father, thank you once again for this day. Thank you, Lord, that you love us, you care for us, you look, you watch out for us, and you just shower your mm. favor and your grace and your love over our lives. Father, we're so grateful for what you have done for us. And we thank you once again for Jesus, the one who has come to rescue us. And it's in his name that we come. We don't come in ourselves, but we come in his name and we come to worship you. We come to worship him. We want to worship the Lord. And we pray that as we do this, Lord, that you would inhabit our praise. And Lord, you would be with every single person mm. that's connecting with us today. Mm. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come from heaven, fill our hearts. 
Lord, Almighty God, thank you for this day. May you bless the words you have placed on Rob, upon Robbie's heart. May you soften our hearts to receive your good word and bless all ears to hear your word. May you impact and influence each life listening. Amen. So once again, we turn to the book of Colossians as we continue our studies in this brilliant book. We're in chapter two 
and we're currently meditating on the benefits of knowing Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And a number of weeks ago, we set out 10 benefits that Paul lists out in verses 6 through 15, and we've covered six out of the 10. So far, they are, we can be strengthened, we can be thankful, we can avoid being deceived, we have been brought to fullness, our old life has been done away with, and we have resurrection power. And today we come to what is simply a fabulous passage of scripture where we begin to pick up the remaining four benefits, which are we are truly alive, we are forgiven, we are declared not guilty before God, and we can be victorious in life. So let's read the passage that contains these amazing benefits of knowing Jesus, reading from Colossians 2, verses 9 through 15, and today Scott is going to read this to us. I'll be reading from Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 to 15. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. In him you were also circumcised, with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and your uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Amen. And may God add a blessing to the reading of his word. What a brilliant passage. And today we are just going to begin focusing on the last few verses of that passage, verses 13 to 15. Let's just, let's allow these words to sink in as we make it personal. When I was dead in my sins and in the uncircumcision of my flesh, God made me alive with Christ. He forgave me all my sins. Having cancelled the charge of my legal indebtedness, which stood against me and condemned me, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. We could repeat these words over and over again and not get tired of reading these amazing words. They just leap out and make you gasp in awe and wonder that Jesus would do that for me, would do that for you, would do that for us. It is absolutely amazing. I was trying to put into context just how good these verses are. And I was doing a little bit of preparation on the train uh, on Tuesday, going down to Edinburgh for Scott's 18th birthday. And as many of you know, I really like a train journey. And well, these verses are even better than a train journey on a sunny day, looking out of the window, watching the landscape pass by. That's how good these verses are. So let's look in more detail at these verses as we delve into how much God loves us because these verses are an expression of his great love towards us. So first of all, in Christ, we are truly alive. That first sentence in verse 13, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive. 
with Christ. Verse 13 starts with the word when. When you were dead. When I was dead in my sins. um, You know, not suppose we were dead in our sins or maybe we were dead in our sins or if we were dead in our sins, but when we were dead in our sins. That is the fact of our condition. I may have been physically alive, but we have to remember that God does not see us merely in our temporary state while we walk this earth. God sits out of time, so God sees us through the eye of eternity. And we need to remember that for us, Hebrews 9.27 says, people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. People like to think that when you die, that's it, nothing, the end. But my friend, that is a lie from the devil and that's what the devil wants you to believe that. But the truth is much more sobering. Listen to these verses from Revelation 20, verses 11 to 15. This passage is talking about the end of the world and what will happen when we all physically die. And these are sobering words. It's entitled, The Judgment of the Dead. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead in it. The death in Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Sobering words. You see, there is an eternity beyond this life. And that eternity is either eternal life or, according to these verses that we've just read from Revelation, if our names are not in the book of life, then our future is an eternity in the lake of fire. That is the second death. And that is a future that I do not want. (laughs) So how do I get my name into the book of life? Because if we are to be judged for everything that we have done, thought and said after we die, then in the words of Private Fraser from Da's Army, we're all doomed. And indeed we are. But surely if God loves us, he wouldn't want to do that to us, right? He wouldn't want to punish us for all eternity. Not if he loves us. And you're right. He doesn't want to do that. He leaves that choice to us. And that choice is based on God's provision of Jesus as an expression of his love for us. God does love you. Loves you as you are. Loves you unconditionally. So how does God express this unconditional love towards us? Well, Romans 5 verses 6 through 8 says that you see just at the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, although for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In the death of Jesus, God was doing something amazing. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.19 that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. Or more famously in John 3 verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal or everlasting life. So what does all this mean? Well, what it means is that God in his love for us 
has made a way for us to have an eternity that is one of life, an eternity with him rather than one of being thrown into the lake of fire. And the way he has done that is he has put everything that we've done wrong, everything that would cause us that punishment, to he put that all onto Jesus and God punished Jesus for our sin. So when we read a verse like Colossians 2 verse 13 that when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. We come to understand that in the sight of God, apart from Jesus, our destiny is death and eternity in the lake of fire known as the second death. But because Jesus has of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, God offers us eternal life not just the breath of life in my body but eternal life he can make us he offers us the the choice to be truly alive there is a song by queen called who wants to live forever and it's a terrific song that reflects on love the beauty of finding the one you love is a moment you want to cherish or stay in forever. Yet it also recognises that uh, this world doesn't afford us that luxury because when our time is over, love dies with it. In many ways, it's a sad song that celebrates the temporary nature of love. Listen to the words from the song, there's no chance for us. It's all decided for us. This world has only one sweet moment set aside for us. Who wants to live forever? Who wants to live forever? Essentially saying, who wants to live forever in a, in, when there is no love? And that lyric captures the tone of what this world offers us. But God in his love offers us that sweet moment of joy. But that moment is for eternity. God offers us not just a sweet moment. God offers us an eternity of knowing his love and enjoying his love forever. He offers that to us through what Jesus has done for us. The song by Queen says that if you choose to love someone, you risk the experience, the heartache that comes when the love of your life dies. If you choose not to love, you are spared that heartache, but you'll miss out on something beautiful. But God says, if you choose to receive his love through Jesus, you will experience that love forever. There will be no heartache. However, if you choose not to receive his love through Jesus, you will experience that heartache of, uh, of not choosing him for all eternity. In this world, people will say they would rather experience love and risk the heartache. But God says experience his love and avoid the heartache forever. The tragedy is that many will choose heartache forever rather than God's love forever. John 1 4 says of Jesus that in him was life and that life was the light of all mankind and then in verses 12 to 11 sorry 10 and 11 it says that he that is Jesus was in the world and though the world was made through him the world did not recognize him he came to that which was his own but his own did not receive him but here is the hope Verses 12 and 13, yet to all who believed in him, who, who did receive him, to those that believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. As I said before, God loves us so much. He doesn't want us to spend an eternity in the lake of fire yet he loves us enough to let us choose for ourselves 
He has made a way for our names to be written into the book of life. And that way is through accepting the one who came to give us life through accepting Jesus into our lives, accepting that he came to die for my sin, accepting that he took the punishment for my sin, accepting that he did all of that for me when I was still dead in my, in my sins and in the uncircumcision of my flesh. In other words, he did that for me before I even knew him, before I was even born, before I even knew there was a book of life. If Jesus did not die, then my destiny is sealed, it's sealed for the lake of fire. Be but because Jesus died, because Jesus took my punishment, the punishment that I deserved, he, God, if you like, picks up his pen, ready to write our name in the book of life. All he is waiting for is for us to accept and receive what he has done for us into our lives. And he can do that because, as the next phrase in Colossians 2.13 says, he forgave us all our sins. Oh, what an absolutely marvellous work that God has done for us through the death of Jesus on the cross. You know, when I was a wee boy, I had a, this picture of God as someone that lived in the house. And, um, but because God was so big, he, he kind of filled the house, like squashed into it, like sitting down and hunched over. And, you know, that he, God was just sitting there looking at everything that we had done and writing down everything that we had done wrong and all that kind of stuff. Like it says in Revelation, the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Well, that's how I imagined God. He was writing down all the things that I'd done wrong. But what God has done for us in the death of Jesus is he's effectively written in that book in the blood of his son, paid in full. He has forgiven us because all of our sin went on to Jesus. And because God punished Jesus, he can't punish us for the same sin twice. So if you like, God has written in the blood of his son in that book where all the things we've done wrong, he's written paid in full right across it. And all he is waiting for is to transfer our name into the book of life. He's effectively forgiven us for everything that we have done wrong. Everything. All of it. But if we want to get into that book of life, we have to recognise what he has done and believe what he has done and accept him into our lives. And he takes that pen and he writes our name into the book of life. What a provision that God has done for us. He's done it all for us. All we have to do is believe and receive. And when we receive, when we accept what God has done for us through Jesus on the cross, our name gets written in the book of life because we made that choice based on what he has done for us. And that's the next benefit of knowing Jesus is, is that we are forgiven. We are present tense forgiven. And he's done that for every single one of us right now in Christ. God has forgiven us, as I've already said. Psalm 103 verses 12 to 10 says, He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him as far as the east is from the west. So far has he removed our transgressions from us. That means, as Paul says to the Romans in chapter 8 and verse 1, therefore there is now no condemnation, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But notice we are only forgiven when we choose the expression of God's love for us in Jesus. We have to make that choice. Because we've all been in situations when we've done wrong and we desire forgiveness. You know, maybe we, we, we've done something wrong against our spouse or a family member, a friend or a work colleague. And it can be hard to ask for forgiveness. Pride gets in the way. So often when we're seeking forgiveness from someone, we have to humble ourselves and we have to say sorry. And we have to be sincere in our apology, asking that person to forgive us. 
And sometimes they do, and it's a blessing and a joy, and sometimes they don't, which is hard to take. But at least if you like, at least you tried. But with God, it's not a will they or won't they forgive me type scenario. Because when we recognize our wrongdoing before him, the wrongs that we have done, yes, we have to humble ourselves. Yes, we have to say sorry and be sincere in our apology. But when we do that, God will, he will forgive us. There's no doubts about it. He will forgive us. It's absolutely guaranteed because the punishment due to the wrong that we have done has already been paid for. Forgiveness is available because Jesus paid the price for our wrongdoing. Jesus carried the shame of our wrongdoing when he went to the cross. He paid the price for our shame so that we could be forgiven by God, so that our name could be written in the book of life. For only someone who has done no wrong can enter into a place that is literally perfect. And that is what God has done for us in Jesus, as Hebrews 10, 14 says, for by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. He has made us perfect forever because we accepted the only way to be holy is through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Forgiveness is a release, a dismissal of something. The forgiveness we have in Christ involves the release of us from God's just penalty and the complete dismissal of all charges against us and more on that next time. To some people forgiveness may seem like weakness or letting an undeserving person win but it has no connection to weakness or even to emotion. Instead forgiveness is an act of the will. Forgiveness is not granted because a person deserves to be forgiven. No one deserves to be forgiven. Forgiveness is a deliberate act of love, of mercy, of grace. Forgiveness is a decision to not hold something against another person despite what he or she has done uh, against you. That's, and that's what God has chosen to do in Christ Jesus. He forgave us all of our sins. Wow. Forgiveness is such an integral part of God's salvation. When Jesus forgives us our sins, our trespasses, our iniquities, our transgressions, whatever way you want to describe it, they're erased. They're wiped off the record. Forgiveness of sin is comparable to financial debt being erased. When Jesus said it is finished from the cross, he was literally saying it is paid in full. Jesus took the punishment we deserved. So when God forgives us from our sins, we are free. We are no longer live under that debt, uh, under that pending punishment. Our sins are wiped out. God will never hold that sin against us. In Jesus' death on the cross, God is literally saying, I love you. So in conclusion, Maybe you've been listening to this and you've never realized that God loves you. Well, God does love you. Loves you so much that he doesn't want you to experience an eternity in the lake of fire. God loves you so much that he gave Jesus as the one who took the punishment for what we deserve. Loves you so much that he offers us the choice of what eternal future we would like to have after we leave this earth. Is it an eternity of heartache because we do not receive God's expression of love for us or is it an eternity of love and life because we do receive God's expression of love to us? You see, Jesus is the only way to know life. He said it himself in John 14 verse six where he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So what decision will you make concerning Jesus? Through the death of Jesus, God offers us a choice. 
He wants us to make us truly alive, not just having breath in our body, but to know eternal life. He wants us to receive his forgiveness. He wants us to be free from the guilt and the shame and live as one for whom there is no condemnation. The choice we have to make is concerning Jesus. Either we believe what Jesus has done for us on the cross, what Jesus has done for me, or we don't. And if you don't, and if you've just come to, well, if you've just come to believe this, then receive it. Say sorry for the things that you have done wrong. Determine to follow God's way and start by asking Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior. That's the way God has made for us to know him. That's the way God wants to make us truly alive. That's the way that we can receive his forgiveness. If you don't believe it, then that's your choice. I'm not going to judge you for it, but you may not get another chance like now. And maybe you will get another chance, maybe not. But one thing is sure, as I know that God will judge you and the outcome will be based on your decision. Not believing and receiving now is effectively setting your course for an eternity in the lake of fire. I'm not trying to scare you. I just want you to know that God loves you and seek, and seek to encourage you to receive Jesus into your life. Know the joy of having your sins forgiven. Be free from shame and from guilt. Know the assurance of having, of knowing that you have eternal life now. Believe in Jesus and that allows God to write in that book of the records, paid in full because it recognizes that Jesus has done it and he transfers your name from the book that condemns you to a book that gives you life, the book of life, because Jesus paid it all. If you're like me, and you've already believed in Jesus and what he's done, then rejoice in it. Celebrate what he's done. My sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. I praise God for what he's done. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that you love us. Father, thank you that you sent Jesus to, as the expression of your love for us. Thank you that you don't want any of us to spend an eternity in the lake of fire. You want us to spend an eternity in heaven with you in a place of love and life and holiness and perfection. So Father, thank you for the way that you have made the way for us to know this. Thank you that you've given us the choice that we can come to know that life through receiving and believing in Jesus. And Father, if there's anyone here today that does not know you, Lord, I pray that you would give them the courage to believe in what you have done for them and receive Jesus Christ into their life. May they know the joy of knowing that their sins are forgiven and their future is heaven. And I pray this in and through the name of Jesus. Amen.
Thank you so much, Rob. And there's that song again. Yes. <laughs> Look at that song again. It's been such a special, yeah, special it's... song for us as yeah. a fellowship. Mm. What he's done. Amen. What he's done. Yeah. Yeah, Great. so yeah, it's thank great. you very much. And you're going to do questions? Yes, yes. So we can look into that a yes. little bit deeper through the week at our life groups. Mm-hmm. Now, we've said farewell to the Williamses. We have. We have, but they're going to join us for coffee Ooh. on the online Zoom. So we get to see <laughs> them again. So if you're watching on online.church, a button will pop up. You can click the button and join us in Zoom for a cuppa and a wee bit of fellowship. If you're watching on Facebook, and you don't know our Zoom details then, please direct message us and someone will be in touch and point you in the right direction. Indeed. So, uh, all that remains for me to do is to pronounce the benediction. So the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance to you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. So thank you once again for connecting with us. Hopefully we'll see you next week. Next week in Trinity Church. Yeah. 4 p.m. 4 p.m.